Okay, well, unfortunately, my uh, recording of last week's session uh, didn't happen, <laughs> or at least it did visually, but it didn't, uh, uh, the audio didn't work. Uh, so uh, I'm going to rerun the recording myself, um, just using the PowerPoint and Zoom and hoping that this will help just to help us catch up. Um, so uh, welcome back. If uh, if this is your second week, let's see if I can get the screen to move on a little bit. There we go. Fantastic. So we started together by saying the creed as we did in week one. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come, judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As I said in the first week, uh, the thing that I really want to draw us to is the direction and the trajectory of the creed. He ascended into heaven, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and in the end he will come to judge the living and the dead. Uh, we believe in the Holy Spirit, the church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, but we also believe in the resurrection of the body, the physical body, and the life everlasting or eternal life, a never-ending life with God in a new heavens and a new earth. Uh, my point this week is that uh, all of us are oriented towards a goal. Now, last year, Hebe and Sam, my daughter and son-in-law, were oriented towards getting married. Now, this year, they have been oriented towards getting setting up a home in Bristol and doing up the house that Angus and Hebe lived in uh, when they were born. Uh, Angus has currently been orienting his whole life towards launching his music career with an EP and a gig at the O2 Academy in Islington in a few weeks' time. Looking forward to that. Uh, right now, as a church, we're orienting ourselves towards our church weekend away in a year's time. Really looking forward to that too. Most of us in a few weeks' time will all begin to orient our lives towards Christmas, uh, if you haven't started already. Uh, if you are facing a change in your work, uh, looking for a new job or having been offered a new role, you will naturally orient your life towards this. Or think if uh, you've been on a holiday recently, what sustains us through the effort of planning and packing and traveling is the dream of the holiday. The goal shapes everything. Now, perhaps think about the American election. Uh, the American election is coming up and the whole of the nation and possibly the world is oriented towards that future outcome. This week, we are going to be exploring what it means to be oriented towards God's future. All of us are naturally oriented towards the future. It's one of the things that makes us human, our ability to conceptualize the future, not just respond instinctively to the present. Think of relationships or work or your health or children or grandchildren or retirement. For good or ill, your vision for your future shapes everything that you are and all that you do. We often call positive visions of the future our goals. We like having goals. And our goals may be short term, like sorting out the gas bill or tidying the kitchen. Or we may have a big long term goal, like moving home or planting a garden. And these are ideas of the future that we feel we have some control over. But there is also the future that we don't have control over. Our older selves, for example, uh, the exam coming up as we turn the page and wonder what questions we're going to be asked or our future relationships. This is normal for all of life and it's normal for religious life. All religions, all ideologies have a goal and a destination that pull us forward to an end and a vision of the future that they want us to avoid. So have a think. What goals have shaped your own life today? If you want to press pause and just have a think about that, that'd be great. Here's another question. What is the destination of the creed? Where does it tell us the story is ending?
Again, you might want to just press pause for a moment. The Nicene Creed, uh, which was written 300 odd years uh, after Jesus's resurrection and ascension, um, which mainly concerned uh, Jesus's um, identity as God, equal to God as part, as, uh, as part of the Trinity, um, says this. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. And it finishes with these lines. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. That's the goal of the creed. Now, when we recorded this uh, or when we did this live in person, uh, we then went to have a little quiz together. So uh, you may enjoy doing this uh, each time. Just have a little think and see if you can come up with the right answers as you're watching this. So this is a kind of recap of last week. So the four covenants of the Old Testament are what are the four covenants of the Old Testament? Uh, they are the Abrahamic, the Mosaic, the Davidic and the New Covenant. Well, there's actually the Noah's Covenant as well. Uh, but we just focused on Abraham's covenant, God's promise to bless Abraham and his descendants, making them a great nation and through them to bless all the nations of the earth. And the Mosaic covenant in Exodus 19, God's covenant with Israel at Mount Sinai, where they were called to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, showing the world what it means to live under God's rule. Then David's covenant uh, or the promise to, that David would have a descendant who would reign over an eternal kingdom fulfilling the hope for a righteous king who would establish justice and peace. And then lastly, the new covenant in Jeremiah 31 verses 31 to 34, a promise of spiritual renewal where God would forgive the sins of his people, write his law on their hearts and establish a new relationship with them. What we notice here is that Jesus doesn't change this story. Instead, he affirms it. He fulfills the promises and calls his audience to get ready for the kingdom of God, which is now at hand. In the prophets, the gospel was an announcement about the coming reign of God is the answer. The kingdom of God equals what does the kingdom of God equal? Interestingly, uh, when I was doing this live, there was a bit of hesitation around this. Now, the kingdom of God equals the messianic age or the reign of the Messiah. So every time you see the kingdom of God in your Bibles, in your New Testaments, you could just say the messianic age or the reign of God uh, or the reign of the Messiah. So here's the good news. The reign of the Messiah is at hand. Or the messianic age is at hand. That would be a good way of translating those words. The two things John told us that Jesus would baptize people with or into were. Can you think what those two things were? Firstly, it was the Holy Spirit. And secondly, it was fire. You remember last week I talked about the Holy Spirit is good and fire is bad. Uh, so he baptizes us with the Holy Spirit, which is the promise fulfillment of uh, Jeremiah 31, that we're filled with the Spirit, so the law is written on our hearts. But he's also going to baptize us into or with fire in order to take away anything that is uh, not of him. The four statements of Jesus's gospel announcement were what? So when Jesus pronounced his gospel, he announced it in a very really simple way. Four statements. And the four statements of Jesus's gospel are. The time has come. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. The time has come. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. Jesus's name, Yeshua or Yehoshua, which is uh, Hebrew for Joshua means what does it mean it means savior or god saves and messiah mashiach means what is the word messiah means it means anointed one which is why i've put an image there of a drop uh, kings 
uh, were anointed and there was an expectation that the anointed one would come the christ the messiah would come uh, who would be anointed by god to bring in his kingdom jesus came to something the law what's the blank word jesus came to fulfill the law he didn't come to abolish the law as we looked at last week he came to fulfill it and to fulfill the law means to what does it mean if you fulfilled the law it means to correctly interpret and observe the law and uh, we reflected together about driving so if you fulfill the law of driving uh it it means that you correctly interpret the road signs and the state of the road and everything else about uh, that you need to know about the law about driving uh, you're on the right side of the road for each country you're going at the right speed you're indicating the right places you're choosing the right lanes in roundabouts and all the rest of it and you're observing the law you correctly interpret and you observe the law that would mean what it is to fulfill the law so if jesus came to fulfill the law it means that he came to correctly interpret and observe the law of god correctly do this that doesn't mean he didn't have arguments or discussions with others who were interpreting the law differently it means that he was bringing the correct interpretation and the right observation of the law drawing people back to god to rightly and correctly observe the law so last week we looked at the four covenants again let's just remind ourselves the abrahamic the mosaic the davidic and the new covenant and you can see in this picture how um, i've put the abrahamic covenant within the mosaic covenant within the davidic covenant and within the new covenant it, and the purpose for this way of um, uh, showing this is that none of them fall away they're all eternal covenants they all are fulfilled or they need to be fulfilled in the next covenant it's not as if they are overwritten but rather that they are expanded and uh that they are they adapt over time but they don't they're not uh got rid of and they are fulfilled uh, and so we are waiting for the new covenant to be completely fulfilled uh, then we had a look at this covenant comparison chart and i uh, was asking us to fill in the blank so we looked at the covenant with noah uh, the scripture is genesis 9 the covenant provisions god will not flood the earth again the obligations on those of us who are obeying the covenant or the people so Noah, Noah and his family basic or ethical standard for humanity and the covenant sign uh, that goes with that is the rainbow when it goes to the covenant with Abraham you get the passages Genesis 12 15 and 17 the provisions or the blessings of the covenant are posterity inheritance land greatness blessing universal blessing the obligations upon Abraham and his people and his was the covenant sign was circumcision uh, and this was the sign given to abraham and all his children uh, the covenant with moses at sinai the scripture comes from exodus 19 to 24 uh, again you have blessings and curses deuteronomy 28 you can find the provisions that if you follow the laws that you'll be blessed and if you don't follow the laws that the people of israel will be cursed and uh, then you get the covenant obligations. What, what do you need to fulfill the law is faithfulness and obedience. And the covenant sign is the sign of Sabbath. This will be a sign to you for all generations that you're following my covenant. You're part of my covenant people. The Sabbath is the same. So we now have circumcision and Sabbath as two signs. The covenant with David uh, is found in 2 Samuel 7. Uh, the provisions are a, a kingdom and a dynasty. Uh, the obligations are faithfulness and obedience and the covenant sign is the house uh, the house of david will continue into posterity the new covenant the scripture for the new covenant comes from uh, can you remember it comes from jeremiah 31 31 to 40 and ezekiel 36 24 to 38 these key passages the provisions were a complete fulfillment of all the previous covenant promises the obligations again faith and obedience you can see that working all the way through the covenants and the covenant sign uh, that would indicate that people have been blessed with this uh, as fulfilling this covenant uh, is the gift of the holy spirit 
both a sign of our obedience but also or our commitment to this covenant and also as an enabler to help us to fulfill this covenant when we last week we talked about the kingdom of god and we thought about it in several ways we talked about god's direct rule that god expected to, uh, the, the people the people of first century uh, Israel and Palestine believe that when the kingdom of God was announced, it would be God's direct rule. God would intervene in history, overthrow Israel's oppressors, whoever they were. But at the, at the time it was Rome and he would establish his kingdom on earth, his rule over the earth, not just over Israel, but over the whole earth. Uh, this was a messianic hope. So the image, was the, the, the expectation was of a Davidic king, the Messiah was expected to lead this kingdom he would bring justice he would restore israel and establish god's reign it would also include the day of the lord this would be a time of judgment on the wicked and a vindication of the righteous and this was a key element of their what you might call apocalyptic expectations they expected that god would come bring his rule the messiah would come on the day of the lord and he would judge the wicked and vindicate the righteous. So when Jesus arrives, he doesn't spiritualize or de-ethnicize the kingdom. He doesn't universalize the story in a way that removes Israel from its center. Instead, he proclaims that the time has come. The kingdom of God or the Messianic age is at hand, fulfilling the hopes of Israel and announcing that God's promises are coming to fruition. Now, we might notice that Jesus never defines or explains the phrase the kingdom of God. And that's simply because everyone knew what it meant already. Just as if you go uh, to a garage and you're listening to two mechanics talking about uh, engines, they don't ever explain a, two, uh, uh, a combustion engine. Uh, they just assume that everyone knows what a combustion engine is and they just get on and fix it. But they don't have to talk about the mechanics of a of an engine uh, to define it they just assume it jesus, jesus likewise jesus just assumes everyone understands the meaning of the, his kingdom gospel uh, in light of the reality uh, uh, that, that uh, and in light of this reality he naturally just like john the baptist did before him not only gave the announcement but called everyone to respond to it to return to the torah to put their trust in him and to seek God's righteousness and his kingdom above all else. So Jesus's message was this. The time has come. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. We looked at how Jesus's ministry was about proclaiming and demonstrating the kingdom. And we looked at the first seven chapters of Matthew's gospel as a great way in. Matthew was keen to emphasize how Jesus fitted into the story of Israel and how he was the fulfillment of Israel's apocalyptic hopes and as the one who ushers in the kingdom of God. And so we traveled through his genealogy, his birth, his baptism, the Sermon on the Mount, and noted uh, how Jesus is shown repeatedly by Matthew as the Messianic king. That's his point. Jesus is the Messiah and he's the one who fulfills the Abrahamic, the Davidic, and the Mosaic covenants and points to the imminent arrival of the kingdom or the reign of God. So we looked at a few things. We looked at Jesus' baptism, John the Baptist, how he prepared his way, and also Jesus' ministry. Each of these things repeat the theme that, that Jesus is the one bringing and uh, uh, fulfilling the prophecies that have gone before him about the coming kingdom and reign of God. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus' message is urgent, and he's calling people to repent, to get right with God, because God's kingdom is near. Healing and casting out of demons, Jesus' miracles, are signs of the coming kingdom, showing his authority over sickness, sin, and demonic forces. Sickness, sin and demonic forces. These acts aren't just an random acts of kindness. They reflect Jewish apocalyptic expectations of the Messiah who would defeat the powers of darkness and restore Israel. We then looked at the kingdom, uh, the Sermon of the Mount to just see how that uh, played into the story. And my point was that the Sermon on the Mount is 
it can be summarized as things you need to know in anticipation of the coming day of the Lord. So th this is Jesus sharpening up everybody, saying the kingdom is coming, but this is what you need to know, given that the kingdom is coming. So blessed are you who are poor in spirit, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. Hang in there. Blessed are you who are mourning, for yours you will inherit the earth. Blessed are you who are peacemakers, for, for the kingdom is going to be yours. Hang in there. Even if they persecute you for my sake, the kingdom of God is yours. The day of the Lord will come. Uh, the, uh, I have come to fulfill the law, not to abolish it. And Jesus talks about uh, a deep calls people into a deeper righteousness, one that surpasses that of the, of the scribes and Pharisees. That doesn't mean um, this doesn't mean rejecting the law, but living it in a way that reflects God's heart for justice and mercy and faithfulness. And so you notice that Jesus dials up the intensity of the law rather than dialing it down. And he fulfills this when he uh, he he brings this to a climax when he says, seek first the kingdom of God above all things. Don't worry about this age, but put your mind towards the age to come. So he calls his disciples to orient their whole lives towards the coming kingdom, to seek first the kingdom of God or the messianic age and God's righteousness above everything else. And this is a call to total devotion, to live for God's king, king, coming kingdom and to align every part of our lives with his will. Uh, and then he finishes the Sermon on Mount with the story of the wise and foolish builders. Uh, which is uh, a, a really uh, powerful story, which uh, talks about the coming day of trial and testing where everyone's house will be. Uh, reckoned as whether it's going to stand or fall and the wind will come the rain will come the floods will come and the question is is our house going to stand and so this is a, an apocalyptic, apocalyptic story of the coming judgment of God those who act on Jesus's words will stand firm when the day of the Lord comes and those who ignore his message will fall so putting all this all together you can see that Jesus calls people to repent and believe because the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent just means to turn away from sin or to turn back to God. And to believe the good news means to trust the good news that God's kingdom is just around the corner. To believe it, actually believe it, and then put your life in line with this trust, with this, with this faith. And it means to follow Him. So He invites His follow His His disciples to follow Him, to leave behind everything that hinders their devotion to God, and to follow Him as disciples, to put His words into practice. Here are some of the key verses that we looked at in week one: Promise to Abraham, Israel's calling to be a holy nation, the kingdom of priests, in Exodus, God's promise to David, an eternal kingdom, the new covenant. Jeremiah 31, Isaiah 61, the spirit of the Lord is upon the Messiah to proclaim good news to the poor. Passage that Jesus picks up in his first sermon in, uh, in the synagogue. Uh, Daniel 7, the son of man coming with the clouds, given an eternal kingdom, coming to judge. And also Matthew 6, 33, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So, Father God, as we look into the next section of our sessions together, Pray that you will come now and help us to understand what it is that you want to put on our hearts. Open us up to the truth of your coming kingdom. The day of the Lord is at hand. May we know what it is. May we uh, learn to expect it and anticipate it and orient our lives towards it. I pray in Jesus name. Amen. Jesus is not trying to change the story. He doesn't adapt it. He affirms it. And the gospel writers repeatedly emphasize the same thing. They tell the same story. Jesus is the son of God, the anointed Messiah, the son of man, the one announcing and pointing to the arrival of God's kingdom. Jesus fits the expectations of the first century Jew and he grabs their attention. Jesus doesn't spiritualize the kingdom. He doesn't de-ethnicize the kingdom or take Israel out of the story. He doesn't universalize the story. He retells the Jewish story, announces that a time has come, that the kingdom of God is at hand. And he invites his listeners to repent and believe the good news. And he calls his disciples to follow him. Jesus doesn't have a problem with the Torah or the law. Excuse me a moment. He doesn't have a problem with the sacrificial system. 
He doesn't have a problem with the idea that some things are clean and other things unclean. But he does have a problem with sin, with death, with evil, with the powers that dominate his world. And so he goes about forgiving sins, healing people, casting out demons, giving sight to the blind as signs that reinforce his announcement about the closeness of the kingdom of God. He calls people to respond, to rethink their lives, to cut off anything that doesn't fit with God's way of living, to leave behind anything that holds them back. He calls them to seek first his kingdom and God's righteousness. He tells his people to pray for God's name to be honoured once again. The kingdom of God is coming. It's at hand. The day of the Lord is on its way. The final judgment is almost here. So get ready, get clean, get right with God, get baptised, receive God's forgiveness. Start again, be born again. Don't miss out. Put my words into practice, says Jesus, for the rains and the floods will come and I want your house to stand. Build your house on the rock. Follow me. Walk with me. Die to yourself and live solely for God. Live for the age to come. That's all that matters. The important thing in this story is that we know where we are headed. And what we're doing this uh, in this session is to have a look again at where we are destined, where all of history is destined uh, to arrive. What's the trajectory of the story of the world? Where are we headed? And what's the biblical story of how history ends? What is our destination? As we know, the biblical story begins with creation. All is good. It's very good. But very quickly, the story turns out uh, into, uh, uh, it quickly goes sour. Uh, and the ones created to bear God's image re reject his authority and they go their own way. You can see on this line um, that there is two crowns, the crown above in the heavens and then the crown on the earth. That's us holding the identity of God, made in the image of God over the earth. And all things are good in the Garden of Eden. Uh, that's why the line is white at that point. But then we fall away from, we rebel against God's kingdom over our lives, his kingship, his order, and we choose to go our own way. And so the rest of the line is dark until it's renewed. But God steps into that story and he uh, wants to respond to it. Uh, just going back a screen, you can see that there are three great acts. There is creation, there is decreation, there's recreation. Creation is the first few chapters of our Bibles. Decreation is the rest of our Bibles. And recreation is the final story of where we're headed. Decreation is where everything, bit of a made up word, but it's, uh, it's everything where all that is good in the world that God has created has rebelled away from God. And as a result, uh, instead of turning towards life, is actually to turning towards death. But God wants to reverse this story and he wants to bring us to recreation and to rebirth. So the heavens and the earth are created. They are polluted and infected by rebellion, but then they are cleansed and renewed, the new heavens and the new earth. And the best way of me explaining this story is this picture diagram by John Harrigan. And I'm so grateful for him for this because it really helps me get my head around it just in a timeline the story is a continuous time and it moves from creation right at the beginning all the way through to our destination in the new heavens and the new earth you can see several things on this um so this is the story that every jew would have heard at the time of jesus uh, so they would have been aware of the Abrahamic, the Mosaic and the Davidic covenants. And they would have known what it was for their people to live in exile and then to hear the new covenant. And then they would have returned to Israel um, or to Jerusalem. Uh, the northern kingdoms of Israel were dispersed, but they would have returned to um, the southern kingdom and uh, returned to Judah. And the kingdom uh, was in some way restored. But of course, they're now uh, being overseen by the Romans, by foreign powers. They've had a number of different powers, the Assyrians, the Babylonians. And now we've got uh, the Romans, these empires that are over, over, uh, over lord, lording over them. And they were anticipating a day of the Lord. That's the big yellow arrow where God's kingdom would come on earth as it is in heaven where God's kingdom would come on earth as it is in heaven. So this would mark 
the shift from the present age, the age of suffering and oppression and injustice, and the age to come, an age of liberation, of restoration, of healing, where all tears are wiped away. And they would have seen this as the new beginning. Uh, and they would have said, this is what it looks like to live in the kingdom uh, of God in the age to come. So this is what you might expect a Jewish story to have looked like or to have felt like for anyone in Jesus's day. So when he announces the kingdom of God is at hand, he's saying the yellow arrow is just about to happen. The kingdom of God is coming. Get ready for this kingdom, this day of judgment, this day of God's wrath, this day of God's cleansing, this day of God's restoration. What we see is the story of Jesus. Uh, so we hear the story of Matthew, that Matthew tells, all the gospel narrators tell the same story, but he is born as a man uh, and he enters the story. He announces himself to be the Messiah in many different ways. And then uh, we know that his story ends with his death and crucifixion. Uh, he predicts this. He says the Son of Man uh, must suffer before he is raised and then ascends to heaven. He is killed, crucified, but on the third day he he um, rises from the dead. And then uh, a few days later, he ascends into heaven at the ascension. And then uh, the, the disciples are told to wait for the spirit to come. And Jesus sends his spirit to live inside the people of God who put their trust in him. So inside you get a new group of people called those who live in the Messiah, who live in Christ. And this is made up of Jews initially. Uh, but very quickly, we, we notice that Gentiles are also included in this community, this new community of Jew and Gentiles who live in the Messiah. So the Jews have their Messiah who has come and they're still waiting for the day of the Lord and the kingdom to come on earth. But they're anticipating that and they are filled with the spirit. But we also see the extension of God's mercy to Gentiles as they're included, too, in this story. And they are dis dis uh, discipled into the Jewish story of the coming kingdom in anticipation of Jesus's return. There are six different aspects of uh, a biblical worldview or uh, an understanding of how history is going to pan out. Uh, when the end comes, the end is going to look like these six things. Now, these are basic uh, foundational 101 ideas that we all need to get in our head and have complete confidence about. Uh, these are the basic foundational building blocks of how G Jesus's story works, how the Bible works uh, from beginning to end. Th these are the things that we need to get into our heads. Uh, number one, new heavens and new earth. Two, the restoration of all things. Three, the day of the Lord or the age to come. Five, the resurrection of the dead. And six, the decisive day of judgment. Now, I know that this is new to a lot of us. Uh, and these aren't foundational ideas that we have in our heads very, uh, very strongly. Uh, I, uh, I'm on a mission to disciple you and to disciple others and to be discipled into this story. And I'm looking for ways. I'm looking for ways to do that. And this is my best effort at the moment. What I'm trying to do here over the next uh, 15, 20 minutes is to go through a few verses of Scripture, which basically reinforce these messages. I want to convince you that scripture is drenched in these six foundational ideas these are not me or um, or others imposing them on the text they are the just the natural reading of the text to us so here we go you ready for this let's go and look at some scriptures we start in the old testament with um uh isaiah 65 and the point of this is to is to say, where does the Bible, where does scripture say that we are all heading? We are all heading to God acting in real time in history to create new heavens, plural, and a new earth. 
Behold, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I will create. For I will create Jerusalem to be a delight and its people a joy. You notice that the story of Jerusalem is continuing in this narrative. I will rejoice over Jerusalem and take delight in my people. The sound of weeping and, and crying will be heard in it no more. In the New Testament, you see the repetition of this story because they are Jews. They hold on to this story and they just say that Jesus is the one that's bringing it to its completion. They don't change the story, but they see it as Jesus is fulfilling exactly this story from Isaiah. So 2 Peter 3, 13 to 14 but according to his promise in Isaiah, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth. Notice that this is to Christians post resurrection, post ascension, post the giving of the spirit. They are still waiting and they are waiting for the new heavens and a new earth in which the in which righteousness dwells. They live in the present evil age and they're looking forward to the age to come therefore beloved since you are waiting for these be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace peace with god what about the last book of the bible revelation 21 exactly what you would expect to see the last chapters <coughs> of scripture say this this is john with the curtain of the story pulled aside and he could see a vision of a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth have passed away and there's no longer any chaos or sea i saw the holy city jerusalem the new jerusalem coming down out of heaven from god prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband and i heard a loud voice from the throne saying look god's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them the temple has been cleansed and so God's earth, his footstool has been cleansed and now he can dwell on earth with them just as he did in the Garden of Eden. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. The old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. So that's the new heavens and the new earth. The second thing we need to get our heads into is, at, uh, is the restoration of all things. Obviously fits with the new heavens and the new earth. Acts 3, uh, 19 to 21. So this is Peter post Pentecost. In, uh, he does some healing of a guy um, silver and gold have i none but what do i have give i thee in the name of jesus christ uh, get up uh, uh, and um, so this is to a guy uh, who is paralyzed and he gets renewed and then in response to the to the the people in the temple seeing the renewal of this guy's body they start questioning peter and peter tells the story of of israel and he tells the story of god and he and he says Jesus is the coming Messiah. And he, and he calls them. And he says to the he says to the people, repent then and turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of renewing or restoration may come from the Lord, and that He may send the Messiah who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. So notice this is after after Jesus has come once, after He's ascended, and Peter is saying that he may send the Messiah as Messiah. He may send the Messiah who's been proven to be Messiah, but he might come as the one to judge the living and the dead, who's been appointed for you, even Jesus. Heaven must receive him until the time comes for God to restore everything. So God's going to restore everything as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. Foundational idea. God is going to restore everything. Creation, decreation, recreation. Matthew 19, this is the, when Jesus is telling the same story. Jesus said to them, truly, I tell you, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones. Notice the Israel story there, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. 
And everyone who's left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. In the restoration of all things, there will be no more death, no more crying, no more pain. You will have eternal life, everlasting life, the restoration of all things. Or going back further. uh, Oh, no, this is the next one. This is right. So that's the restoration of all things. The marker between these two ages, uh, uh, between um, the the thing that's going to bring in the restoration of all things is the day of the Lord. And you'll see that the progression of this through scripture as we start in Isaiah and then work our way through. uh, The day of the Lord is something that cleanses and purifies and restores everything to its original uh, uh, purposes. So just as we have a computer uh, and sometimes it gets clogged up with a whole load of stuff, in order to restore it, you need to press factory reset and you, you need to cleanse it of all, all the gubbins that is clogging it up. You need to restore it. So Isaiah says this, wail for the day of the Lord is near. It will come like destruction from the almighty because of this all hands will go limp every heart will melt with fear terror will seize them pain and anguish will grip them they will writhe like a woman in labor they will look aghast at each other their faces aflame see the day of the lord is coming a cruel day with wrath and fierce anger to make the land desolate and destroy the sinners within it The stars of heaven and their constellations will not show their light. The rising sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. I will punish the world for its evil, the wicked for their sins. So there's cleansing and there's justice. There's punishment for anything that is evil or wicked. I'll put an end to the arrogance of the haughty and will humble the pride of the ruthless. I'll make people scarcer than pure gold, more rare than the gold of Ophir. Therefore, I will make the heavens tremble and the earth shake from its place at the wrath of the Lord Almighty in the day of his burning anger. So a very powerful and chilling uh, prediction that one day God is going to come to purify the earth, to rid it of all evil to cleanse the hard drive as it were and anything that doesn't fit with him will be taken away anyone this is a very challenging passage it carries on through the old testament and then in through jesus's ministry and then through into the apostles teaching too Isaiah 24 the earth reels like a drunkard it sways like a hut in the wind so heavy upon it is the guilt of its rebellion that it falls never to rise again Notice the story of a hut in the wind that falls. Remind you of any story that Jesus told? In that day, the Lord will punish the powers in the heavens above and the kings on the earth below. Notice that there are powers in the heavens, plural, above, and also the kings on the earth below. There are powers on the earth below. And he'll cleanse and bring justice in both spheres, heavens above and the earth below. They will be herded together like prisoners bound in a dungeon. They'll be shut up in a prison and punished for many days. The moon will be dismayed, the sun ashamed, for the Lord Almighty will reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and before its elders with great glory. In the New Testament, this same idea is picked up again. The day of the Lord, the day of the Lord, the day of the Lord. 64 times, 66 times, I can't remember, uh, it's repeated. That's a lot of times for a phrase to be repeated in the New Testament. 1 Corinthians is just one of those places. 1 Corinthians is one six. God thus confirming our testimony about the Messiah among you. Therefore, You do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus, the Messiah, to be revealed. They are waiting, eagerly waiting for the Lord Jesus, the Messiah, to be revealed. He will also keep you firm to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of the Lord Jesus, Messiah. 
So there is a day that has now become not just the day of the Lord, but it's now become the day of the Lord Jesus, the Messiah. The day of the Lord has become the day of Christ. The day of wrath has become the day of Christ. The day of judgment has become the day of Christ, the day of the Messiah, when Jesus comes again. And you can see how in these early letters, Paul and others are writing to the early church to tell them that God is uh, encouraging them with spiritual gifts to keep them in touch uh, with him uh, and to keep them faithful to him, ready for the day of the Lord, blameless on the day of the Lord. Two Thessalonians is one of the earlier letters. And it says this. You'll see that it, these are often at the beginning. The day of the Lord language is often at the beginning of a, an epistle or a letter. Um, and that what strikes me about that is that I discovered this on sabbatical is that when I was underlining anything to do with the ending or the day of the Lord in pink, I noticed that these are often at the beginning chapters of the letters because that's the worldview. It's the foundational worldview of the early church. Paul says this. God is just. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you and give relief to you who are troubled and to us as well. In other words, there's going to be justice. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. He'll punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They'll be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might on the day he comes to be glorified in his holy people and to be marveled at among all who have believed. This includes you, because you have believed our testimony to you. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. And then there's talk of punishment and justice where people are excluded as well as included. On the day of the Lord. Romans 2, again, note at the beginning of the story, early chapters. But because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath, when his righteous judgment will be revealed. God will repay each person according to what they've done. To those who by persistence in doing good seek honour and glory and immortality, he will give eternal life. But to those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there'll be wrath and anger. If we are oriented towards ourselves and we reject the truth of God's kingdom coming and we follow easy evil, there will be wrath and anger on the day of God's wrath. However, I thank my God, says Paul, every time I remember you in all my prayers for all of you. I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on until completion, until the day of Christ. That the seed sown in you will bear fruit and that you will be faithful right until the end at the day of Jesus Christ and therefore avoid the day of wrath, the judgment and the fire. So new heavens, new earth, restoration of all things, the day of the Lord. And then we come to the age or this age and the age to come. This is a really simple idea that there's two ages. There's the present age and the age to come. Ephesians 1, again, early chapter, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope, what's the hope, to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the future, in his holy people, that you become part of God's holy people in the future, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ or the Messiah from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. He's been exalted above all powers now. He is ruling in order to bring his 
get things ready for his return to come. Uh, so he rules in the present age, but also in the age to come. Titus 2. This is a passage we read at Christmas time. Love this passage. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people people what's the grace of god it's the gift of jesus the gift of the messiah has appeared that offers salvation to all people it teaches us what does it teach us to do it teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions in other words to avoid being caught up in the way of the world in this present age to avoid that and to live self-controlled and upright and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope the return, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Saviour, Jesus, the Messiah, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify us for, for purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. You can see the summary of why did God send Jesus? He came to give himself for us to redeem us, which means liberate or rescue bring us out of wickedness which is we are enslaved in wickedness and to be purified for himself with the people that are his very own eager to do what is good because the spirit lives within us uh, encouraging us to live uh, uh, to do the things that are good he, he wants to righteousify or justify us so that we become good from the inside out on the day of the Lord, there will not only be the restoration of all things, there will not only be a new age, there will be the resurrection of the dead. Uh, this is a bit of the gospel story which uh, we are less familiar about. We don't talk about it so much, but it's really key. It's foundational to the New Testament and it's an aspiration of early Ju Judaism, in the first century Judaism, and uh, it's carried on all the way through. It's become a little bit twisted and changed over time so that we uh, dial it down now in our uh, Greek influenced and Roman influenced lives. Um, but it's time for this to be renewed and restored in our because this is the story of scripture and it's the story of uh, the New Testament and it's the story of Jesus. So Philippians 3, 10 to 12 and 20 to 21. It's about the resurrection of the dead. I want to know Christ. I want to know Messiah. I want to get there. I want to know the power of his resurrection. And I even want to participate in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. Because I know that if I participate in him as fully as possible, even in his death, I might somehow attain to the resurrection of the dead. So what's his goal? His goal is to attain the resurrection of the dead. That's why he's willing to risk everything in the present age, because he wants to obtain the even better goal. As some of us have uh, financial advisors and they will say, put aside some of your money now so that you can grow it over time and live on that in the future. Paul is doing no different. He is he is sowing his body now so that in the future it will be even better in the future. So somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already obtained this or, or arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus, Messiah Jesus, took hold of me. But our citizenship is in heaven. That's where identity lies. It's like saying um, if you're a British national outside of uh, uh, Britain and you live overseas, your citizen uh, citizenship is in Britain. And you wait for someone from there to bring you back home again. Our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly wait a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables us to bring everything under control, will transform our lowly body so that they may be like his glorious body. What is this transformation of our lowly bodies that they may be transformed? What is this? It is the resurrection of the body and the life of the world to come. 1 Peter 1, again, first few verses. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus, the Messiah. Praise be to, to, the, to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus. You can see how Jesus is placed front and centre as Lord and as Messiah. In his great mercy, in his great mercy, despite all that we haven't done, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Because Jesus has risen from the dead, we have a living hope that we too will rise from the dead.
Do you know that this is our future? Resurrection of our bodies, just as Jesus' body rose from the dead? I am the resurrection and the life, says Jesus. This is the hope he wants to plant inside us, that we can be included in the resurrection of the dead. Even though we're not Jews, we're Gentiles, we can be grafted into this resurrection story. The author to the, the people of the Hebrews in chapter 6, 1 and 2 says, Therefore, let us move beyond the elementary teachings about the Messiah and be taken forward to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death. So don't have to keep going back on the same old ground or faith in God. This is this is normal everyday stuff or instructions about cleaning rites or the laying on of hands or the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. These are all foundational stuff. Can you see how resurrection of the dead is just one of those foundational ideas that lies at the root of Christian theology? If you want one chapter in scripture which talks about the resurrection of the dead more than any other, go to 1 Corinthians 15 and you'll hear Paul talk about just kind of work his way through with people and just trying to help them to hold on to this truth about the resurrection of the dead. Lots of discussions to and froing, but it's great and uh, it should give us hope. Later in the passage, verse 49, just as we've been born, we have been born just as we have borne the image of the earthly man. So we bear the image of the heavenly man. I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the messianic kingdom, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. But listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. The last trumpet is one of those Jewish apocalyptic little catchphrases that when the Messiah comes, there'll be a, a, a fantastic trumpet, the last trumpet, and the, everything will change at that moment. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with imperishable and the mortal with immortality. We know that our bodies are mortal. They are, they are failing every day. A bit of it falls off and, and, and gets less strong. Uh, we know that uh, our, our lives will come to an end. We, we can delay this. We can push this back. We can, uh, we can try our best to extend the quality and the length of our lives. But ultimately, we know that our lives will come to an end. Our lives are mortal. So we need to gain immortality. We need a new body for this immortal life. That's what we're being offered by Jesus. An immortal body to go with immortal lives. How are we doing? Last one, foundational idea is the decisive day of judgment. Again, this is something that we've dialed down in more recent years. In other e epochs of church life, this day of judgment was dialed up. In our day, we have dialed it down. It's time to find a new place for this message. So we've talked about the age to come, this age and the age to come, the resurrection of the dead. And lastly, we're talking about the decisive day of judgment. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of the Messiah, so that each of us may receive what is due to us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Since then, we know what it is to fear the Lord, to fear this judgment day. We try to persuade others because we want them all to be able to stand. We want their houses to be intact. We don't want them to fall flat, just as we don't for ourselves. 2 Timothy 4. In the presence of God and of Messiah Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead. Notice the living who are alive at the time and the dead who have already died. And in view of his appearing and his kingdom, the age to come, I give you this charge. What must you do, given that the age to come is at hand? Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. 
As for me, I've fought the good fight. I've finished the race. I've kept the faith. Now, there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. You see, a longing for his appearing, longing for the righteous judge to come, longing in anticipation for the one who is going to give me a crown of righteousness, give us a crown of righteousness, judge us according to what we've done, because we have lived according to the fear of the Lord. We've put Jesus' words into practice. We've loved God with all our heart, soul and mind. We've loved our neighbours ourselves. We've cut off everything that doesn't belong to God and his kingdom. We've sought first his kingdom. We have received his spirit that's enabled us to participate in this life. And we've been declared righteous and just by Jesus through his death and resurrection. In Christ, we get all these things and we long for his appearing. So here they are, the, the six elemental ingredients for a biblical worldview. A new heavens and a new earth, the restoration of all things, the day of the Lord, this age and the age to come, the resurrection of the dead, and the decisive day of judgment. Here are some questions to ask. How does this strike you? Is there anything new in this for you? Which part of this is the best news ever? You might want to say, is there any bit of this is not sounding so good? Is there a part we could leave out? Is there any part of this story you could leave out? You might want to pause this video here and just answer. And I'll have a mull on these questions. If you want to do some homework, uh, how about you read 2 Peter? 2 Peter uh, uh, is a very short book, three chapters. Uh, it's drenched in these ideas there all the way through. They are completely about uh, being ready for the day of the Lord, anticipating the age to come, looking forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. And they are connected to Peter, one of Jesus's closest disciples. They tell the story and they convince me again that this is normal, everyday Christian expectations. I believe in the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Have a look at 2 Peter, put it on uh, your phone, listen to it read it, enjoy it, and do some thinking about it and see whether God might use this as a way of helping you to engage with this story. That's all for me now. Um, I just wonder if there is anything else that I could say. Let me just see. Just uh, picking up a few questions. Uh, this is for further thinking. 
uh, you might want to reflect. Uh, we all have goals that shape our lives. How does understanding the end goal of the Christian story, the coming of God's kingdom, change the way that you approach your own goals and decisions in your daily life? Um, the creed summarizes key elements of our faith, including the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. How do these belief, beliefs shape your hope for your future or the future of the world for those that you love? Uh, in the Old Testament and the New Testament, how is the day of the Lord described? How does it serve both as a warning and a source of hope for believers? Jesus calls us to live as if the kingdom of God is uh, right at hand, really close. How would your life be different if you lived with a constant awareness that the day of the Lord could come at any time? Reflect on your life's current orientation. What goals, habits or priorities could shift if you placed greater emphasis on the eternal perspective Jesus calls us to embrace? And lastly, the creeds end with an affirmation of life everlasting. How does the hope of the resurrection and the restoration of all things influence the way that you face difficulties and challenges today? OK, that's all from me uh, this week, and I look forward to sharing uh, more in the weeks to come. See you in a couple of weeks time.